Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is Professor Hamamoto. It is September 6th, year 2022, 3 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Can you hear me in the comments? I'm not sure. Am I online? Okay. I'm going to assume that I'm I'm good to go and, and live. And, and I got a call as, <laughs> as soon as it went live here. So I don't know what that meant. Um, yeah, I was checking out some of the comments before the live cast today, which um, I'm not even going to attempt to um, bring any sort of comprehensive understanding of the doors, Robbie Krieger, any of the individual people, or even try to fully reconcile all the different charges and accusations, most of them BS, that have been lodged against the Doors, Jim Morrison, the whole Laurel Canyon scene. It comes from, I think, originally the MI6 um, information, disinformation agent, uh, John Coleman, and then later on, the uh, jacket was handed over to this guy named Dave McGowan, who I've critiqued on and on. And I notice here that um, one of you in the comments says, I can't wait to hear this episode. Doors are my favorite band of all time. <clears throat> it comes to light through people like Jay Dyer. The, the Doors were a fraud. Still great music, can't deny that. Well, Jay Dyer is, is um, probably uh, being influenced by, like many other people who don't know what they're talking about, uh, by uh, the Dave McGowan thesis. And um, uh, I notice he has like a weekly show on the uh, Alex Jones show <laughs> deal in order to bring the newbies into this idea that the 60s were a giant social engineering success story of the CIA. And my biggest argument against that is that despite the best efforts of the people who claim to have omniscience, political power, whatever it is, the human spirit, we, the people, are able to overcome it and circumvent it and even prevail over it. So what it is is a psyop in order to um, make a surrender to their omnipotence ahead of time. That's my one and only argument that I'm going to make against the, the um, McGowan thesis today and all the different imitators, the biters, the plagiarists, your Jay Dyers. And I hear it all the time. And if you're Tuning in um, <clears throat> to this cast to see that you're wrong. If you're you're, you're going to be disappointed. And if you're tuning here today, by the way, it's about 110 degrees <laughs> outside and not much uh, cooler here. And you might hear some noise on the microphone here because I got my fan blowing um, full blast at me so I don't pass out. And I'll have to be taking uh, multiple swigs of water to keep myself hydrated. So you're not going to hear a lot of smut. In fact, um, um, I'm going to share with you my surprise and that uh, this autobiography recently, I think came out last year, by Robbie Krieger filled me with the surprise. Uh, it's really two books. Of course, he's dealing with the doors, but at least 50% of the books is about Robbie Krieger, qua Robbie Krieger. That is a guy who was married to the same woman for 50 years, has a now adult child, had a life. I didn't even know he was a scratch golfer. Him and his twin, I didn't know he had a twin brother. Uh, I knew very little bit about the Krieger family, his father and his mother. And most of you only know partial bits of it, selective cherry bit biographical elements of all the principles that we'll be talking about today, ranging from, yes, Jim Morrison himself, well, let me go in this in um, order of age. Uh, that would be Ray, Ray Manzarek, who is the oldest of the group. He was two two years older than uh, Jim Morrison, and uh, then you have um, I guess it would be uh, John Densmore, who was the drummer, and um, of course Robbie Krieger, uh, Krieger uh, was the oldest. He was only twenty years old. When the only the first song he ever wrote, "Light My Fire," became a colossal hit, and he goes into the whole ins and out of how it kind of happened. It wasn't their 
first recording. The first one was a dud, and they had to put out Light My Fire in an edited version in order to get some sort of airplay. They had miscalculated. Anyway, I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of it, but it's all here if you want to check it out. Let me give credit to his um, co-author. His, um, his name's Jeff Alulis, and you'll see a document, uh, an interview with Jeff Alulis, the co-author, with Robbie Krieger on YouTube. It's well worth watching. It's very long. He's very eager, intelligent, and knowledgeable. Um, I think he's in about his 30s, right, which testifies to the fact that there is a demonstrable cross-generational interest and even serious research into the phenomenon called the doors, not just cultural forensic research, musicological, political, uh, institutional research. So despite the best efforts of uh, uh, Jay Dyer and uh, all the other imitators of Dave McGowan, your psyops is not working, okay? Because fortunately we have enough of these people who are around testifying, and of course the social media, right? They, they're right, they have this interview together to refute all the propagandists that the intelligence agencies would have jackets to, you know, file folders in order to write these types of books like um, Strange Goings On in Laurel Canyon and all that. Not to say that there's not a, a bit of truth to it. I mean, as I learned from reading this book, Robbie Krieger's father was, um, I guess you could describe him as an aeronautics engineer. And um, he designed some of the aircraft that helped bring victory to the Army, U.S. Army Air Force during World War II. And I think he was also involved in Cold War research and manufacturing. Because remember, okay, this this helps people understand when Dave McGowan says, oh, yeah, everybody's in all these groups dead were involved in the, the national security complex, right? David Grosby, Frank Zappa. You know, my mother worked for the <laughs> She was a high school graduate. That was Southern, that was L.A., that was L.A. Orange County. That was one of the main, if not the main industry at that time, 50s and 60s. And that started to kind of dwindle down in the 70s. But there was tons of Cold War funding going in. And that's where all the people moved, you know, the highly trained and educated engineers like uh, like the elder um, Mr. Krieger, who was a really cool guy, uh, very supportive of his son's creative endeavors. He even bought him his, uh, he bought two classical guitars straight from the, the makers in, in Spain and one flamenco because that was one of Robbie Krieger's passions. And uh, his mother was also sort of a bohemian type. But even then, of that generation, because we usually, you know, we're looking at baby boomers, right? But what about the people who went through the Depression and the war? His father had, some serious, um, I guess today we call them trauma issues. He'd have these panic attacks and he'd have to undergo therapy. He doesn't really get into it, but this is really a, a revelation in this book and I'm really thankful for it. Uh, and his mother also had uh, some problems with um, what we, what back then were called uh, painkillers or what today would be considered opium, opioids. And so she was able to kick as well. So what that tells me is that as early as the late 40s and 50s, the what now is Big Pharma was hitting the middle class at first, upper middle class, just like in psychiatry, psychotherapy, very, very hard into bringing them first, not us. We were the second generation to undergo this uh, type of control into psychiatric uh, pharmaceutical control. It really started with, with his parents. Now, he doesn't frame it that way, but I'm reading it critically against the grain and uh, seeing it as such, okay? So you're not going to see much, uh, hear much smut, although there's plenty of that uh, if you want it. Now, um, you know, I try to, I pose this question that they mean for myself, why why even bother in 2021 or 22 rather? <laughs> I'm a year behind. This book came out in 21. Um, about the doors outside of their popularity. Well, to put it simply, I believe that they are his historically important, just as the beat movement was important during 1950s. 
just like the fin de siècle intellectuals of late 19th century France, Paris in specific, were important, the so-called lost generation, right? Ernest Hemingway, you know, the, the romance and the stories about that. Um, James Joyce, you know, that whole, even James Baldwin kind of caught the, the tip end of it. And by the way, yeah, we know OSS CIA types are assets such as George Plimpton were, were involved in that at a very early stage. So I don't rule out that within the periphery or even within the core of what was going on here, there were people that were coordinating a lot of efforts here. But uh, to my point that I'm trying to make here is that why are they important? Because the 1960s, despite all the other counter propagandists, were a definitive crisis point for the uh, million, what's today called a military industrial uh, establishment, the pharmaceutical establishment, and groups like the Doors, even though they were suffering their own problems, presented a significant challenge to the legitimacy of that whole interlocking system, which very few people knew about when the when the Doors first broke. We've learned in subsequent decades the extensiveness and the comprehensiveness of this system. And yes, before you put in the comment, yes, uh, Jim Morrison's uh, father was the uh, Gulf of Tonkin. Yeah, we know that. You know, thank you for discovering the moon and sharing your findings with us. So don't bother with that, okay? We're, we're well beyond that. Uh, the point is that he was a disruptor in his own family. He liked to push the limits. And uh, uh, Robbie Krieger suggests that at early age, um, he might have known that he had some sort of con congenital health problems that, where he wasn't going to be living long anyway. So he was just going to put it all out there um, in the span of the 27 uh, short years that he spent here on Earth. Speaking, you know, I said I wasn't going to get into the gossip, but I must address because Krieger really goes into it. It really kind of um, miffs him, if not pisses him off totally. He's, um, even though they reconciled before uh, Raymond Zarek died him, himself of cancer, that uh, Raymond Zarek said that it was a hoax that uh, Jim Morrison died. So there you have it. Raymond Zarek was pushing it. He even wrote a poem, a short piece of fiction that presented that, but he was putting that out there uh, at a very early stage, right? I said I wasn't going to dwell on it, but for those of you who came to think I was going to deal with such superficial, simplistic uh, clickbait, there you go. That's about all you're going to get. Okay. Um, most of you know that um, the incredible director, whatever you may think of him, right? Oliver Stone. He directed a feature film direct, uh, featuring, uh, starring Val, uh, Val Kilmer, right? Did a good job. I saw it when it came out. This is back in 1991, right? And by the 90s, late 80s and 90s, a reassessment was already taking place. And it's kind of interesting that Krieger had tried to shut it out. He didn't even realize the degree which his own group, that he, he was invited into it as a guitarist, and it was through... Uh, Ray Manzarek and Dens, uh, I think that, that brought him into the group that really solidified that core quartet there. But he, even he himself was oblivious. I think it's kind of charming in a way. The fact uh, he was oblivious to the fact that he had influenced a whole new generation of musicians, many of them who became, who were known as the punk era grunge and beyond, right? And uh, there's a lot of details about that playing with the new generation of musicians. And uh, it's not going to be, it's it's plausible to believe that their influence is going to be uh, long lasting, as long lasting as the Beatles and, and other groups, right? Now, um, he gets into, um, of course, what, what's a uh, Professor Hamamoto talk going to be without me inserting myself? Not only because I was a teenager, you know, 14, I was in junior high school when the doors hit, at a really impressionable age. However, I wasn't able to get in, in, into any of the clubs. So, regretfully, I never saw the doors in a club setting. 
And I never saw them in a large 20,000, 10,000 arena setting either, which maybe is all for the better. You know, I never saw Hendrix in a club, never saw Cream in a club. But I did see uh, Hendrix in the, I think it was the, um, um, I think it might have been what was in the, um, you know, where the Lakers played, right? The arena in Inglewood. Um Maybe it was a sports arena, I remember. And, and I did see uh, Kareem. I think I saw the Kareem at the Anaheim uh, Convention Center. Uh, I saw Zappa. The, you know, I've seen most of the top group, but I never saw the doors. If you did, please put it in the comments here. Because <laughs> um, I, according to Krieger, the best performances of the doors were never captured on film. And of course, not on smartphone. This is back in the day, right? You had to have been there to have experienced it. And so we'll leave it at that. Now, what was interesting, because I told you I'm going to spend most of the time on Krieger, Qua Krieger, right? Robbie Krieger. What was so surprising to me is that uh, Robbie Krieger was the bad boy of the group as a child. He was upper middle class. I told you his father was highly educated and was operating at the highest level of engineering with the National Security State. He was a world traveler doing business, no doubt, for the Pentagon. He doesn't say that. I'm just inferring, right? The, the defense contractors. <clears throat> but he was a bad boy. He was getting into mischief and trouble. I don't know if he had any learning disabilities. He doesn't really get into it. He wasn't much into school. He wasn't stupid. He was smart. He was a kid of privilege. His parents gave him everything. Um, but his twin brother, not identical twin brother, also had problems. So I don't know where this comes from, right? Krieger doesn't say much about it, although he talks quite a bit about his twin brother, who sadly, and I never knew this until reading the book, who sadly his body was found floating off uh, in shallow waters. I think it was off Malibu, someplace like that. Whether it was suicide, murder, who knows. But he had had mental problems for quite a while. In fact, Robbie Krieger had even, even to try to, I guess, give give his brother a, some sort of focus. He was even generous enough to buy his brother and his wife a working ranch so they could uh, have a, an income. But uh, more importantly, it's uh, a foundation to that would bring him uh, to stability, but even that didn't work. So there were some problems uh, with the family. He claims there were, Krieger claims there were multi-generational. There's some drug addiction with, with parents and whatnot. I don't know what the situation is. They're going to have to be more research done about this. But this is the first time that we got beyond the, just the sensationalism and cherry picking of the Dave McGowan Laurel Canyon thesis set. And uh, believe me, I'm only scratching the surface there. I encourage you to pick up this book. It's going to be well. And thank you to my Patreon supporters who are growing in numbers because you're finding out all the good stuff I'm posting on Patreon just for you. And I got some goodies for you after the show. I'm going to wait until I do this show before I do some of the administrative work. Uh, but but do read this. It'll come out in paperback shortly, but it's uh, well worth your library. Don't rest with the early one. The Danny Sugarman book, No One Gets Here Out Alive. John Densmore wrote one. Um, of course, um, Ray Manzarek, I've read them all. Okay, and I'll tell you the truth. And I've warned against this to you. And it's a warning for me as well. Don't ever stop with what's out there and think you know it. Like, oh, yeah, I got that. Like, you know, like the people in the comments, oh, yeah, I haven't heard you talk about, you know, the Knights Templar. Hey, how come, you know, because why? Because you wrote one, you read one book on the Templar and you think you know it all? Or you read, you know, by saying you read uh, Dave McGowan and you know it all? Okay, that's kind of like that imprinting situation again. So I fell prey to that as well. I had very low expectations for the Krieger autobiography. And I spent early this morning till shortly before their time completing the book and said, oh my gosh, I almost fell into the old 
the same trap that I warned against. So anyway, this is seen as an endorsement for the book, but it's also a warning for you and me not to stop with these supposedly authoritative accounts, which typically, especially if they're really convincing, right? And think that you've got it down. Oh yeah, I got it wired. Yeah, I understand totally. You don't, and I don't. And um, that's why the beat goes on, as Sonny and Cher goes so far as historiography and research, real research, not Googling. Right, that's not research. I'm talking about that this book was heavily fact-checked. They went to archival work. There's a body of scholars. There are people who are doors scholars now, just like there are Beatleologists, uh, I guess you can call them there, right? Just like there are people of who are experts in Mozart and Beethoven. Is that really far-fetched? Yeah. You know, some of these people who we revere today, they fell into obscurity before some person said, Oh my gosh, we got to rediscover these. Check them out. They're one another part of the canon. Same with movies. Um, yeah, I won't, I won't digress, but I was watching some documentaries about some Hollywood directors that I had vastly uh, underappreciated. Now I'll have to go back and check them out as well. So Krieger, if, it, if we, if, if it was to be predicted, who was the guy that was going to do all these crazy stunts? Like, well, you know them all, right? That are attributed to Jim Morrison. Most of them didn't happen. It's just part of the lore that you and I want to believe. And Oliver Stone helped perpetuate it. And Robbie Krieger says, yeah, we know it's a movie. It's fictionalized. It's a biopic. But nonetheless, these have the tendency of becoming history. Right. And maybe that's, you know, what goes into the uh, Mandela, is it called, uh, process, all those different types of rewriting of history that these composites that come through here. But anyway, uh, to finish up that point, I would have thought that it would have been Krieger who would have been the raging drunk. And, and that's true about, about Jim Morrison, the uh, drug addict. And by the way, it did kick in, which was an astounding part of the book, the second part of the book which I'm glad I didn't stop. It's just the part that I was familiar with. And I was riveted by it, uh, reading all the way through airtime. He devotes a long, a long time to devoting to, to uh, discussing his, him and his wife, who he had been married to by now over 50 years, to heroin addiction. I never knew Krieger was a heroin addict. I knew about the early LSD experiments with John Densmore, which they finished up with early on. And I thought that was it. Maybe they would smoke a little, you know, some jazz cigarettes, you know, marijuana every once in a while. And they did the transcendental meditation. But I never imagined that he was involved with heroin. This is the first time I, re I, I understood that. And he goes into great, great depth that how we got into it and um, how we got out of it. And then really oddly, how he got back into it and then left it and then got back into it, right, over and over again. And I didn't know that he also had um, a encounter with the big C, cancer. And I learned in the latter part of the book, that's why you got to read it all the way through, that he did not go through chemotherapy. I'm not going to go into specifics because I don't want anybody who is suffering from health problems to just either have their regime threatened or whatever treatment you're under. Uh, I don't want to throw you off. I read the book if you're interested about it, but he rejected it and uh, went into um, immunotherapy itself. And he gives a name for the drug that he used. I'm not going to give it here because that's not what uh, this talk is about. You'll have to read the specifics about um, but it's worth following up on because he's giving us some um, some valuable information. Uh, again, that um, cancer is not a, um, a death sentence, just like the 60s was not a death sentence for the counterculture and opposition to the so-called powers that be. 
right? In the quest for insight, poetic insight, intellectual inquiry. It's only proper that Jim Morrison was buried in the renowned Paris uh, cemetery, Père Lachaise, right? I think subsequently his family had his body taken away, which I think is a good idea because uh, by the time I visited the gravesite of Jim Morrison at uh, Père Lachaise, this was in 1990, right after the fall of the Berlin Wall, I just finished my first book, Nervous Laughter, one of the great titles of all books. It was about situation comedies. I've been into media studies, cultural forensics a long time. That was a way for me to grasp with me part to 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 kind of encounter what it meant being part of the television generation. And it's a, a monograph, by the way, published by a CIA publishing company <laughs> that I later learned about because they want to know what's going on in minds like mine. So why not control the publishing? So you can say, hey, I'm a CIA asset. I'm a dupe, right? It's called Prager Publishing. Look them up, right? They're in there. They published my first book, Nervous Laughter, and it's the first and the best. And there have been other books subsequently, but the best decade by decade analysis of the television situation comedy from its radio antecedents, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, to the 90s. Well, not to the 90s. It was published in 89. Uh, but I'm not interested in doing a second edition. I didn't mean to go off on this tangent, but that's what brought me to Père Lachaise. Um, I was free of the book, so I decided to go. I was invited with a, said, hey, but let's go to, um, let's go to uh, Berlin, because the, the Berlin Wall had fallen in 89. And, I'll, and I'm telling you this because there was hope in the air that the Cold War was finally over. And if you listen to the doors, like Jay Dyer probably has not, and during my fasting and cleansing process over the past month, I listened to this, their second album, Strange Days, quite a bit because thankfully I have the LP original, of course, which I bought as a teenager. It was finally reissued a few years ago in um, the mono version, which is superior to the stereo version. So I listened to it as, it as it was originally released. So I was free of my publishing and I went to Berlin and uh, my friend wanted to go listen to some um, tourist jazz, you know, in the, uh, you know, the fifth uh, arrondissement or the, the tourist traps here. I said, screw that. I don't want to hear some fake Sydney Bechet jazz, you know, in the 90s for the tourists. Uh, I'm going to go out to Père Lachaise. I went by myself and pay homage to, to the great poet, the great American poet, James Morrison. And sitting there was nothing but a bunch of Euro trash, pouring beer on his gravestone, smoking joints and stubbing out cigarettes on his headstone and singing in a drunken lotus state before I slip or we slip into unconscious, you know, crystal ship, right? Uh, it was an awful mess. I didn't stay there very long. So anyway, that's my personal, that's the only time I was with, with uh, Jim Morris and I didn't see him on stage, but I saw his gravesite. And according to Ray Menzer, the keyboardist, <laughs> there was nobody in there. Okay. Um, I was always interested, um, really fascinated to learn that um, Krieger, since he was such a bad boy, is uh, he'd been tossed out of public school so many times. His father, was, who was affluent, sent him up north, up to Menlo Park area, which is in the Silicon, what is now Silicon Valley area. So he went to the Menlo Prep School. So he had this prep school background. Sound familiar? Yeah, yeah. Robin McLaurin Williams. Right. We have David Cranmer Underdown do a whole show here about his background with that same prep school that Robin Williams went to. I think there's a strong prep in, in the American scene prep school connection between 
some of these traumas that we see in the later life of these people. It's not in the book. This is just conjecture on my part. It's analogous to the public ex public school experience of a lot of British artists and intellectuals. And um, they necessarily didn't go to public school. Peter Sellers didn't, but uh, many, many of them did, including Jeremiah Tower, who was an American who was sent to a British um, public school and was buggered and uh, turned out and later came back to America and became the father of California cuisine. He's the real artist, the brains behind uh, Chez Penis in Berkeley that Alice Waters, I think she, even she has to admit that. And there's, there's all kinds of books on that. That's um, Jeremiah Tower. So anyway, I, I, I'm not going to digress here, but I'm making all these these mental notes as I'm reading through the um, autobiography. Uh, interestingly enough, and again, I'll you know because I think that's partly why you're one of the um, nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine <laughs> subscribers to this channel. I'll take this opportunity to all you tourists that I like to insult, right, to subscribe to this channel. Push me to the ten thousand mark. OK, and then later on, you can unsubscribe for my disrespecting Jay Dyer and all your other, you know, pseudo intellectual heroes who have a little set. They have little bookcases behind them and they wear a jacket. And you're probably going to think I stole his uh, his act. No, I was he was a comedian. OK, I really was a professor in a previous incarnation. This is not like. Dr. Dre or Professor Griff or some other conceit. I am Professor Hamamoto, Professor Emeritus of the University of California. Most of you who are my subscribers and my Patreon people know that, and you're astounded by the fact that, man, how did you last so long in that, in that setting? How did I last so long? Because I was influenced by Jim Morrison as a teenager. I said, I want that life. I can't be in a band, right? I can't be in a band. They never put me in there, right? Even if I was, by the way, you see that guitar in the background, the head, right? I guess it's to my right. That's a SG Special Gibson, very similar to the guitar that Robbie Krieger used, right? Why did I buy it? Because I wanted to, not because I wanted to be Robbie Krieger, but I wanted to, understand the tool that he was using in order to come up with some incredible music that these Dave McGowan imprint ducklings are fixated on. And before I leave the show, I'm going to show you the music genius and inspiration of the doors that these other characters can't touch it. Because as you know, I'm steeped in the music. So how did I last as long as the UC? It was by looking at the career of John Lennon, of Ray Manzarek. These were the people who told me it was possible to retain who you were as a creative being and to go against the tide and prevail. They gave me that sort of inspiration, strength, and something tangible, the music, the writing, the speech, the poetry, and even the persecution, right? We know that John Lennon was most likely assassinated by agents of the state somehow. There's some suspicion that Jim Morrison met the same fate. Perhaps I will as well, but it's too late. Most of my work is um, is out there. And I'm putting, I've been putting some of my private journal work on the Patreon too recently for the past month. And I've got a year and a half worth of my shows on YouTube. And uh, those videos are out there. They've been, they've been archived. Okay, so on a personal, enough about me, except for one last deal. I was really surprised to see that because, you know, as you know, well, Robbie Krieger was totally into flamenco. And he was not an, he was not a tourist. He was not a wannabe like, a, like oh yeah, I play guitar, I play music, yeah, I'm into rock. Yeah, I play jazz, you know, uh, but most of them are wankers and wannabes. But he was serious about about um, flamenco, 
And he, in the book, he says he took lessons from a guy I know. His name's Frank Chin, Chinese American. He's a playwright. You'd have to look him up. He never really made it into the big time, but he was um, a force to be read. Well, actually, he was at a, he had a play produced, um, I think, by uh, Public Theater. I think it was one of the big ones. And you know, he was the first guy of Asian American because, as you probably know, I wrote a, a second book called Monitored Peril. It's mostly the Asian people who are dumped on and are made fun of like on TV and movies and in theater, right? But Frank Chin broke the mold. Anyway, I wasn't meaning to go on there, but I thought it was really cool that Frank Chin had given um, our friend Robbie Krieger a lesson. And by the way, I knew Frank Chin enough where we had been to dinner. I had invited to my classes to lecture because he's an important artist within uh, my world. And I even took him back to his motel room over at UC Davis when he was paying paying a visit. He said, come in here. I want to show you something in his motel room. I'll, I'll move on in a second because we're running out of time. And he said, um, hey, check this out. And it was a guitar case. I said, I said, is that your guitar? He said, yeah. And I said, oh, well, I knew you played flamenco. And he said, um, yeah. And I said, I take this away everywhere. But by the way, he was the first Chinaman, as he like proudly called himself, he was the first Chinaman to be hired by the, um, I think it was Pacific Union Radio, uh, Railroad, right? They were the ones who used Chinamen to build it, but he got a job. With, so he was a pathbreaker in many ways. But so he busted out the guitar and he started playing flamenco just to, just to, you know, just to hang, you know, he wasn't trying to impress or anything. I said, oh my God, this, anyway, I just thought I'd, it's just one of the strange um situations that I find myself in periodically. Leave yourself open to these experiments, uh, these experiences, and they'll happen to you as well. Um, anyway, uh, be, as I said before we quit, I want to show you uh, the degree which the doors were self-conscious artists and very much aware of other currents, cultural currents, especially in the era of jazz, which by that time it was taken seriously by Time Magazine and Newsweek. Before it was just whorehouse music. People like Miles Davis said, no, man, this is not nigger music, man. This is black music and you're gonna respect it just as we respect ourselves. We wear shirt and ties and jackets when we perform. And you're going to listen to what we have to say. And one of his acolytes, Miles Davis, was John Coltrane, who later on to become a huge influence on me, intellectually, creatively, biographically. But you see, the doors were, you know, especially John Densmore, Robbie Krieger, and... Um, Ray Manzarek were closer in age. They saw the John Coltrane Quartet at the jazz clubs in LA. I was too young. I couldn't get in there. It's drinking. It's a drinking mistake. You, you might be able to sneak your way in and sit and stand in the back if you're lucky, but you have to be 21. But they saw them live. Now, later on, when I was in college, uh, Professor Stephen Buchanan at Cal State Long Beach took us to Redondo Beach to Howard Rumsey's By the Sea, and I got to see McCoy Tyner, right? He was the pianist for the John Coltrane Quartet, right? He was there. He was the guy that did that vamp that later made into Light My Fire that was adapted by Ray Manzarek. That McCoy Tyner, I saw him, and I sat in the front row right at his right hand. It was, it was, because he's a very physical player. And later, when I returned to class at Cal State Long Beach, it was a course, by the way, in black music. There was a course in jazz history, which had become respectable. But then Dr. or Professor Stephen Buchanan, who also had a radio show in Long Beach area, said, no, I'm going to put this in the curriculum, black studies. And this is about black people's music and our ownership of it. Right, and I took that course. I think it was one of the, I think I took it as a freshman. So thank you, Professor Buchanan, uh, for that incredible exposure. 
Yeah, but anyway, the next time I showed up for class, he was asking, so what did you think, seeing, seeing McCoy Tyner? Um, I think it was Azar Lawrence who was playing a tenor and soprano, who's good in his own right, but comes right out of the uh, Coltrane bag. Uh, and I told Professor Buchanan, I said, I said, I had a religious experience. I said, I, I had never had anything like that before. I was in church. And he just smiled, <laughs> you know, because he knew exactly what I, what I was saying. <laughs> anyway, if you listen to the recorded music and don't watch it on YouTube, if you get some of the DVDs, watch John Coltrane. He is so heavy. Anyway, I, I, I want to get to this little breakdown here about the Coltrane, how he took the popular forms, turned it inside out and made it into a statement of own. He took it from the sound of music. My favorite thing sung by who? Julie Andrews, who was the husband of Blake Edwards, who directed Peter Sellers. Wow. Okay, before I keep tripping, let's go into this. Baseline, this. Coltrane's dancing soprano is supported by McCoy Tyner's piano vamps and Elvin Jones's jazz waltz groove. When Coltrane comes in with his melody, it's different than the Rodgers and Hammerstein original. Mm -hmm. Coltrane's version of the melody is syncopated, and he adds a short vamp to the end of each phrase. This allows him to pull you into a hypnotic spiral. And once you're in, it's hard to get... Do you hear that vamp? Boom, 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 boom. Now that's in three, four time. Ray Manzarek put it in straight four and that became that vamp of that incredible solo. And the long version, not the radio version of Light My Fire with that incredible uh, Vox Continental organ solo by Ray Manzarek and it's modal, right? They're not playing through harmonic, they're playing through two chords, basically. That's called modal. I'm simplifying, way over simplifying. And then, of course, Robert, Robbie Krieger comes up with this incredible guitar solo that we all know and love. Uh, using, you know, they, they put it up, uh, I think, a full step. They went from um, A minor to, 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 to B minor. So just to um, irritate you, uh, Dave McGowan, uh, Jay Dyer fans, here's a uh, tutorial, note for note. This is a, a young guy, I assume, who is duplicating for us and transcribing I'm only going to play a part of it. The Immortal Solo by Robbie Krieger, the autobiographer of this. Here you go. Eat your heart out, Jay Dyer. Do that bam. Bum, 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 bum. I don't want to run it. <laughs> you know, listen to the recording yourself, study it. There's all kinds of these little uh, tutorials that you can find on YouTube. But you can see the influences of Indian music. I know it sounds generic, but more specifically, the influence of Ravi Shankar, because both uh, John Densmore and um, Krieger were students of this school that had been opened up under the auspices of Ravi Shankar as his disciples there. And so they were very serious about this all, all the way. They were not a bunch of potheads, LSD, CIA, mind-controlled people. These people were serious artists who were... And they were doing this, by the way, a year and a half, two years before the Beatles. They got into transcendental, transcendental meditation before the Beatles. They were not copycats. They were, they were really exploratory uh, on that on that level and 
to, to, let me add this to the to the stream here just very quickly about the raga influence because you can hear there this long extended modal improvisation that was an innovation at the time that comes from that direct influence of the Ravi Shankar. <laughs> favorite things. Indian classical music. One key feature of Indian music is the raga, an improvisational framework that is not unlike modes in Western music. The Indian influence also comes through in Davis's bass line. Indian classical music is usually anchored by a simple, low, droning part. Drawing from Indian music allows Coltrane to stretch Rogers and Hammerstein's piece to its very extremes. Okay, you get it, right? It's there. There's a continuity between all these different groups. Now, look at Coltrane said, I'm going to take a pop, you know, Broadway tune. I'm going to turn it inside out. That was an inspiration to me. I said, I can approach popular culture, popular culture studies, and I could turn it inside out. And I can create something called cultural forensics that's going to reveal to us something deeper about our socio-political, our cultural, our historical past, right? By looking at Peter Sellers, why was he, did he have this, this hard on for Chinamen and for Indians? I think it's part of the British imperial deal, but it's also because he was a Hazar. He was related to the Chinamen and the Indian, but he wanted to be British. So he had to dump on the people who were most like him, the Turkic, Kipchak Turk Hazars, who were, who were lumped in together with Jews is, you know, three centuries ago in Britain and were always held suspect, right? Anyway, that's another talk and I alluded to it when I was um, going into this on John O'Loughlin's show. But the point is, is that by listening to John Coltrane and all these jazz, like going back to the beboppers, they would always take these pop tunes, Cherokee, Broadway tunes, and they would turn them out. They would subvert them. They would... They would do all kinds of interesting harmonic uh, 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 reharmonizations and you name it. And then eventually that wind up to you. So, so I said, hey, that's going to be my bag. I'm going to look at popular culture and uh, I'm going to play it for all it's worth. And that also, by the way, gets the audience in, into it, you know. People say, oh, Peter Sellers, by the way, that has almost 2,000 views now. Yeah, we want, you know, we all know him from Dr. Shangela. And then when you're hearing all the stuff you want to hear, right, all the Stanley Kubrick gossip and all the Nazi stuff, all the stuff you know or you think you know, then I bring in my own modal improvisation a la John Coltrane. You dig? Okay, so I'm also reviewing to you my work, my MO my modus operandus, right? Don't think Jim Morrison and all the, these Jimi Hendrix, you know, all the, and the contemporary run artists themselves, you don't think that they did this spontaneously. No, they spent a lot of time pondering all these issues. Some of them had music training like, um, like Miles Davis. They, they, they studied, they went to the New York library and they borrowed scores, or in his case, I think he went to Juilliard before he dropped out. And they looked at the scores of the Impressionists. They studied hard, right? All these people, any any endeavor um, that seems easy. Um, it's the point where you can just say, hey, I have a YouTube channel, I'm a researcher. Um, <laughs> you probably found out pretty quickly how, how real tough it, it is. It's no cakewalk. So anyway, let me, since we're down to the 10 minutes, I also got some really deep insight on the last days of Ray Manzarek, who could be, I think, credited for being the guy who put together the doors himself. He was also the older of the bunch. I didn't know he was in the military, by the way. He was in the U.S. military. He got himself out by pretending that he was a homosexual, which back then was a crime. So he could have been thrown into a military prison, but they 
kicked him out. So maybe he had pull. I don't know. But anyway, that's that's another story altogether. But by the end, he had uh, contracted um, cancer and he was unable to pull out of it. And the reason why I want to end on this seemingly tragic note, because it's not tragic at all, because what the tool that if you want to call it, it's more that it's an instrument, it's a musical instrument. The musical instrument that Ray Manzarek relied on was hardly known, except to other keyboardists. It was uh, created by a engineer by the name of Harold Rhodes. And he had first made portable keyboards for World War II veterans who were convalescing in hospitals, right? He felt that the music itself is healing, but there were no portable key. There was no Casio. There were no Korg. This is something that he devised on his own, and he took them to veterans' hospitals, private hospitals, and gave lessons and tried to do an early version of what today is called music there. That's Harold Rhodes. So his intentionality for pioneering his, his other incredible instruments, which are really highly coveted today, that they're even restored, and some companies have even tried to duplicate them. It's Harold Rhodes, look him up. He's an American inventor. He's like, he, uh, there's a guy in the pedal world named Mike Fuller, but the history is uh, Leo Fender, who made Fender guitars, right? There's all, the history of American innovation is full of these inventors, these home, see me Mosley, Mosley right, in LA, right? the country guy, right? The list is endless, and they're not only in music, right? But he was one of those guys. But anyway, as uh, Ray Manzarek was dying in the hospital, he, like the person who brought him to fame with his instrument, the Fender Rhodes bass, keyboard bass. You know that bass part on Light My Fire? That it's called ostinato in, in music theory, right? Terminology. Boom, 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 boom. That, that's the Fender Rhodes bass. And since Robbie Krieger was, was the rich kid of the band, they hit up his father, who was really cool. <laughs> Uh, to buy that Fender Rhodes because they couldn't find the basis that they could really work with the doors. So he said, oh, no, you guys got to pay me back every single cent. I don't want to buy it, you know, you, you guys. But, he, you know, your dad's got to make it hard for you. But he paid for it, and he never took a penny in repayment for it. But that was the base that went into the signature sound of the doors that we know today. And it is hypnotic. It is Raga-like. And maybe that's why I think a lot of these newbies think, oh, it's got to be MK Ultra. But good music will put you into that state, whatever format, whether it's raga or not, whether it's country, it doesn't put you in. That's why people keep digging it. And that's why performing music was put under attack during the lockdown. They wanted to put all these creative individuals and put them in home and so they can go crazy. But it didn't work because they're coming back. You're coming back stronger. Yeah, lockdown, take that. You've done a lot to revitalize our arts, our letters. Yeah, you've also created a lot of YouTubers, but you know, you can't have it both ways, I guess. So here is um, uh, Ray Manzarek. Peace be with you in heaven. Prayers to his widow, Dorothy Fujioka who is a fellow Japanese American. She's someone I'd like to interview, by the way. And his son, you know, prayers to you. And uh, peace to you in heaven, Ray Manzarek. But here he is in kind of a warpy tape, which probably won't get me a copyright strike, but the other ones might, I don't know. That's why you notice I didn't put any Doors material on here. But he's demoing Riders on the Storm on the Fender Rhodes piano. That's the Harold Rhodes instrument that you hear on, you know, the intro to You Are my, you are the Sunshine of My Life by Stevie Wonder. That's a Fender Rhodes. You've heard the sound, but you don't know who Harold Rhodes is because Dave McGowan tells us that all pop music is a CIA psyop so that you will dull yourself to the beauty of 
American life and culture. But Professor Hamamoto in cultural forensics will not let that stand, even if I insult you or disappoint you. I think you're going to be more rewarded if you get over your prejudices and follow this playlist of mine and keep an open mind and follow this trail that I have set for you in the future. Maybe you'll go down the same trail and exceed me, which is my fondest hope. But anyway, let's take a look as we conclude this cast. I'll say goodbye at the end of the great Ray Manzarek. So one day we're jamming in the studio, I mean in our rehearsal studio, in the Doors workshop before uh, we got, uh, before we started recording. And uh, for some reason or another, Robbie was playing his twang guitar. And we were doing, oh, uh, cowpoke went riding out on dark and windy day. And uh, Jim said, I got lyrics for that. I got lyrics for that. And he had, uh, Riders on the storm, riders on the storm. And I said, wait, wait, okay, that's great, man. Riders on the storm. We can't, but we can't do to, we can't do Vaughn Monroe or the old cow poke run riding out one dark and windy day. So I said, let me see what I can do with this. And here's what I came up with. We got to put some jazz to it. Make there's it the ostinato figure. And sure enough, this is what happened. But before we get to that, oh, oh, oh Jerry Sheff says when he when he comes in, we've got the whole thing together. And Jerry Sheff says, "What's the bass line?" I said, "Like simple, E minor, A major." He said, "Oh man, that's impossible." I said. What? For you? That's not impossible. Let's, look at this. It's like nothing to it. And he said, uh-uh. That's, that's on the piano, right? That's on the keyboard. Sure, that works great on the keyboard. There's nothing to it. Watch this on the bass guitar. And I don't know what the hell he did. He had to go through machinations, like turning his wrist up virtually upside down, inside out, trying to play it. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, man, but it sounds so good. And it's so easy on the keyboard that you got to play this. And he went, okay, okay, I'll play it. And here's the rain part. Thunder. After we finished the song, he said, Oh man, I've got super rain. Okay. So one day we're jamming oh, in the studio. Sorry, okay, I'll, I'll end it right there as we wind down. But to finish up the story, um, on his deathbed, and this is in the book, it's really point, and they, they, all of them, the remaining doors, reconciled by the time of their death. They'd have made, made amends. There's a whole chapter or two. I won't bore you with all the different lawsuits with the different parties and the different families, but they had reconciled by the end. But on his deathbed, just like Harold Rhodes went into making these small portable keyboards for recovering veterans of World War II or convalescing in therapy, what was Ray Manzarek doing as a lifelong music? Come out of Chicago, by the way. He was very much steeped into the blues tradition and into jazz. He was such a hipster, right? And a, and a writer, you know, a, a literary person, I, I believe, uh, in his own right. But what was Ray Manzarek doing as he was suffering from the terminal stages of his cancer? He was playing piano for all the nurses and the fellow patients in his hospital. So that's the story, the more complete story of the doors. And it's just a small little dent in the big artifice that's been built over the past 10, 15 years by all the psyops. And they're not in psyops, these are just biter imitator people who think they know about the history of the 60s, the 70s, the, and all of it, right? These are the the uh, demoralists, let's call them. They're there to demoralize you. 
and um, believe me, they have <laughs> they have big support. <laughs> That's why I have only nine thousand subscribers. <laughs> Am I making you feel guilty? Subscribe, right? I must be real, man, because my numbers are being suppressed, and and uh, my material is some of the best on YouTube of across any of it, if I may humbly say so. Anyway, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for allowing me to ego trip at the end. Maybe I'm getting delirious. It's really, really hot. I'm just thankful that I did not pass out from heat stroke. And I'm more, even more grateful to the fact that I see the familiar names in the live stream. And I thank you here for, um, for again, supporting my work. So, God willing, I'll be back with you Thursday with some um, even more interesting uh, material. I spent part of this morning, I should tell you, looking at some old publications that you won't find anywhere because I have my sources, right? I don't look at YouTube and um, websites and other uh, articles and call myself a researcher. Yeah, I know all about Little Canyon. Um, no, I, I go further upstream to that. But uh, I have, I've been gathering a lot of material on Santa Barbara County, Montecito more specifically, because I alluded to the fact, someone you picked up on it, that uh, I want to start checking in about this, the history uh, of this area and uh, what might be coming out of it fairly soon. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks again. That's my time. Have a good evening. And remember, only you can prevent forest fires. Thank you very much. Bye.